Good evening. I'm going to call the Monday, January 16th, 2023, regular council meeting to order. And I'd like to first recognize that we hold this meeting on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First People. And just taking a look at the agenda tonight, I do want to say that in these chambers, we express or hear and express different views and different opinions at times, and we have different ways and manners of expression. And that is welcomed in here, definitely, as the collective intention of this space is to make decisions that better the city. But as we engage with the material tonight, especially if we are particularly passionate on a particular item, it's important to remember that we preserve a respectful discourse and make this a safe and comfortable place for everyone to express their views. Our clerk tonight is Ms. Sheila Gurry, and tonight's regular meeting will be held in accordance with the Community Charter and Council Procedure Bylaw 2018, number 7272. The question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to the left for agenda items only. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. Members have been granted to join the meeting electronically, and Councillor Ben Gesselbrock is joining us. Welcome, Ben. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items, which we have three. We're adding Delegation Andrea Paris regarding human trafficking and sexual exploitation awareness event. Under item 12A, uh, 264 Nickel Street Nuisance Property Abatement, we're adding the delegations Tim McGrath and Ann Livingston. And we're also adding item agenda 12B, Bylaw Notice Enforcement Amendment Bylaw 2022, number 7159.18. Council, I'd look me looking for a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Moved by Councillor Sort, second by Councillor Perino. Any discussion on that? See none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we need a motion for the adoption of the minutes as circulated, which there are three. Moved by Councillor Hemmons, second by Councillor Eastmere. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, which brings us to rise and report uh, from the in-camera Council meeting of the t December 19th uh, of last year. A few items, uh, Councillor Thorpe and Perino were appointed to serve on the Tourism Nanaimo Society Board of Directors for a period of two years, and Council Eastmere would be acting as the alternate. Councillor Hemmons was appointed to serve as a non-voting director on the Nanaimo Prosperity Corporation Board for a period of two years, with Councillor Armstrong uh, serving as the alternate. Uh, myself, I will be appointed to the Nanaimo Systems Planning Organization, for a period of two years with Councillor Hemmons acting as the alternate. And Councillors Manley and Perino were appointed to sit with the mayor on the protocol agreement working group with Sinemo, uh, as well as to sit with the mayor on the tripartite uh, agreement with Sinemo and the Nanaimo Port Authority working group. Councillors Thorpes and Hemmons were appointed to sit with the mayor on the Port Authority City of Nanaimo liaison committee. Council, and Councillor Eastmere was appointed to the design advisory panel with Councillor Armstrong acting as the alternate. Uh, we have no presentations, uh, which brings us to committee minutes. Uh, no motion is required, but there's six there, uh, six uh, um, minutes from meetings for information. We have no consent items, which brings us to delegations. Andrea Paris uh, regarding human trafficking and sexual exploitation awareness event. Welcome. Please come to the podium and you have five minutes to address council. Thank you. Good evening, councillors, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, and staff. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrea Paris. I have been very active for the last 30 years in community. Some of you know us, Trusty Bankowski, volunteers, and the last seven years, thank you. The last seven years, I have been the chairperson for the Zonta chapter in Nanaimo. Our organization is well over 100 years old, and Nanaimo is marking the 30th year. So why I'm here today, tonight, is to share about what's going on in our city. As you know, there's human trafficking, huge. We know that Nanaimo, Victoria, and Vancouver is even worse. 
So why I'm here tonight is to give you an idea of what we are doing, how you can help us. As serendipitously, I have discovered a format which I think you're gonna welcome, and I'm inviting you to join me in this journey. So let me take a deep breath. It's been a long while I have taken public speaking. So first, I'd like to invite you to our event, which is going to be on March the 8th. It's going to be at the Generations Church. Unfortunately, my information didn't make it into, so you will get another email. I'm also not going to bore you with all the data. I'm just going to invite you first to March 8th to the Generations Church in the afternoon. And last year, we had Councillor Armstrong coming and attending, and Don Bonner as well. It will be an event on awareness. Our organization is not about preventing in a big way as other people expect it. We cannot help with housing or anything else, but we can bring information to the students and the students get awareness. Awareness prevents human trafficking and mostly sexual exploitation. It is so huge in this city in that three years of COVID era, what we had is a thousand fold increased. So the good news for you, that we have an organization which has an international goal to reduce human trafficking, sexual exploitation. Vancouver Island University has a need for sponsorship. Our organization is able to provide sponsorship for criminology students who actually need to do some kind of service to the community. So we have discovered this venue which will actually give you a free event. So students are doing practicum for students in the non-IMOs population to benefit. So what I'm asking here tonight, to join me in this journey and somehow form a partnership with us. I am so handily able to organize all the events. I am just looking for your support to say that when I am talking to the public, we can say school district 68 is on board, city of Nanaimo is on board. We are working with an international unit Zonta and eventually for your next year's budget, I can come back to your financial committee and say, what forms and shape you can work with us as a partner. We are always looking for a venue. We are always looking for some sponsors. We already have enough sponsors to cover the event, to host it for free for students and provide food. And we'll fill up the Generations Church twice, 400 people. So this is my pitch for you in the five minutes I've got. So I'm looking for support to work with you. I already have discovered the system which works. I just need your blessings. Give your name and work with us. Can you do that, please? <laughs> Thank you, Council. Any questions for the delegation? This is my elevator. Please. Councilor Perino. Um, Mr. Chair, if, if I could just ask Ms. Paris, could you send us an email regarding the March Absolutely. the 8th, just because it'll be hard to remember from tonight. Absolutely. Okay, good. Just so we, we have it in address and so forth. Thank you so much. Thank You're you for welcome. your presentation. Councilor Archer. Oh, thank, thank you very much, and thank you for all your work on this. Are you working with the Nanamo RCMP on this as well? Yes, I am working with Ms. Sherry Wade, and she said, let me know what we want to give her and direct. So my goal is BIU, School District 68. We already have partnership with Christian School, Aspen Grove, School District 72. So work the um, surrounding school districts for Nanaimo, put Nanaimo back on the map and say, hey, we are doing something really important, human trafficking, is so taboo, and especially this year, the Breaking the Bias theme for International Women's Day gave us an opportunity to bring this information back to all of people to learn. It is actually happening, it is serious. We know it's a crime, we know it's an underground organization. We strongly feel that by awareness to the younger ones, because we know it starts at age of nine, we are able to make some impact at the school level for children. That's our main focus. And that's where you come in handy. That's where you're gonna be able to help us. And it is not gonna cost you a lot because I can so handedly help you. And if by any way we can come and join any of your working committee, it would be just awesome. And as a, as a follow-up, and I would also suggest that you might wanna work with Snamo First Nations, Denalis, and Stamanis. Correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you. They're the most impacted. Council, any other questions for the delegation? Mr. Councilor Manley. And I'm waiting for the mic. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, when you send us the email, can you let us know what your specific request is yes, absolutely. For, for assistance? And, and Correct. I am, there. what looking for is to say the city is supporting this event and we can call you as a partner. That's number one. And it's just a promise and something we can use as advertising. And second, 
to bring in a budget and an expectation of what our wish list is where you could fit in financially. But mainly what I would love you to do is just tell Port Theatre to give me the theatre for free. And I would be happy because I can feel the theatre, right? The need is so huge and, and, and we have enough people who work in this community because we discovered this venue. They are all willing to work together towards the one goal to reduce suffering in Nanaimo. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Paris, and I see no additional hands up, so we look forward to your email, and thank you for coming thank here tonight. You. And I'm going to excuse myself, and I'm going to take off if it's okay. I don't mean to be rude. That is okay. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on to reports. Uh, item 12A, 264 Nickel Street, Nuisance Property Abatement. Uh, Mr. Lindsley, to introduce this. Good afternoon, Council, or good evening, Council. Uh, the first item on your report agenda is a uh, nuisance report for 264 Nickel Street. As recommended or requested by Council, we're bringing this report forward for your consideration. And as outlined in the report, it is, uh, it is staff's opinion that uh, the use of the subject property unreasonably interferes with the person's use or enjoyment of property and requires repeated calls uh, from both city and police services to abate those nuisances. And as per the recommendation, we're recommending that the property be designated a nuisance under the city's nuisance abatement and cost recovery bylaw. Uh, so through the chair, just for a brief moment on what that means, just to be clear for maybe people watching. So if a property is designated as a nuisance property, uh, what it specifically allows for, primarily allows for, is cost recovery any time that a city, uh, the city services or police attend the site. So for example, if there's a call from uh, for the bylaw services to attend the property, then there's a charge under the schedule of the bylaw, which I believe is $250. Uh, those charges go to the property owner. And again, it's, a, it's an attempt to uh, bring properties into compliance with their bylaws and to, and to mitigate the nuisance. Uh, Mr. LeBerge is here with me this evening, and we're certainly happy to take any questions. I know you have some delegations on this matter, so happy to do it now or after the delegations, whatever you wish. Thanks, Mr. Lindsay. Uh, Council, is there any questions for Mr. Lindsay or Mr. LeBerge before we go to delegations? Oh. Is there any questions for Mr. Lindsay or Mr. LeBerge before we hear from delegations? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, go into delegations. The first delegation is Colin Middleton from the Nanaimo Area Public Safety Association. Welcome, Mr. Middleton, and you have five minutes to address Council. So, thank you very much. Okay, we just, yeah, we just leave it there. Uh, good evening, uh, City of Nanaimo Council. On December 5th, this council directed staff to prepare a report on the activities occurring at 264 Nickel as they pertain to Nanaimo's nuisance property abatement bylaw. The following statements are just a sampling of comments from residents neighboring 264 Nickel since the December 15th meeting. Uh, I cannot go through all of them uh, because there are far too many. Um, I don't even use my backyard right now because I don't want my young child to see, smell, or hear everything going on back there. I had a man ar around New Year's ask me for a smoke, and I said sorry, and he charged up my stairs, mumbling something, so I ran inside. I understand the point of this place, but from what I can tell, it is not helping anyone. I thought having this place would contain the drug use, but it doesn't. I feel terrible for the businesses beside this place. The compound is devolving physically and in terms of operations. I have serious concerns around impaired drivers after people are using at Nandu. This morning I had a group of people using drugs several feet from my back gate in full view of my children. Someone at Nandu spilled an entire 60 gallon barrel of used cooking oil down the alley drain which took several days for city services and contractors to clean up. There is a bicycle chop shop that pops up in the alley by dumpsters one of the at one of the neighboring businesses. The noise from fighting, banging, loud music, and ambulances wakes us up at all hours. Some of us had, have had to Narcan people. These are distressing and traumatic events for people living in the neighborhood. Uh, just the other day, um, a user at Nandu stole somebody's wheelchair from the MGM restaurant, and a good Samaritan next door um, worked with the police to retrieve it. Um, several other, uh, I mean, I keep getting bombarded with, with these these comments. Um, oh. Ministerial Order 488 orders regional health boards to provide overdose prevention services. It is M488 that advocates for harm reduction, safe supply, and the rights of people who use drugs refer to in order to justify open air illicit drug use, which they deem as socially acceptable and even a basic self care practice that the province ought to and has subsidized. 
When I asked our regional health board, the Vancouver Island Health Authority, about their delivery of overdose prevention services at 264 Nickel, they had this to say. On screen are direct quotes by Island Health. It seems as though our regional health board isn't providing overdose prevention services as defined by M488, or at least they prefer not to admit it. I want this to be plain and clear. We as concerned Nanaimo citizens demand that the city exercise its authority to declare 264 Nickel Street a nuisance property until the impacts of the surrounding neighbors are substantively and consistently mitigated. When I talk to people about our group's advocacy, I'm struck by how surprised most are to learn that just how much public money is being handed out to save lives seven years into the opioid crisis with no end in sight. They are appalled that our public institutions are allowing common sense to be left in the rear view. Most people haven't been speaking up in opposition to the drug user liberation movement simply because it, rightly, had never occurred to them that they would need to. It is self-evident why no one would want to live next to a site like Nandu because it is obvious what the consequences would be. If I were in the throes of addiction, I would consider it, albeit in hindsight, a godsend that my neighbors and public services recognize that I am in need, get me off the street and away from predatory dealers, off the drugs that are killing me, and support me in psychological trauma care until I can move forward and find a healthy, productive community in recovery. By tolerating illicit drug use euphemistically as drug user liberation and safe consumption, we are participating in a reverse form of nimbyism. We are telling our fellow citizens that we're content to let others deal with the consequences of our own blissful compassion. As long as it's not in my backyard, I can indulge in a self-righteous delusion that I am supporting those less fortunate at the expense of those NIMBYs who live next door to Nandu. I plead to my fellow citizens to see the distress that the neighbors to Nandu are in. They aren't mean or cruel. On the contrary, they have a tremendous amount of compassion for those suffering an addiction. Their quiet, law-abiding existence has been thrown completely unexpectedly into vicious turmoil by some of the most destructive forces of urban decay we have faced in our lifetimes. We need the city to uphold its bylaws and declare this site a nuisance property. If it doesn't, there is literally no stopping these kinds of sites from showing up in your backyard next. Thank you. Council, any questions or points of clarity for Mr. Middleton? I don't see any, so thank you, Mr. Middleton. Uh, our next delegation, uh, Mr. Tim McGrath. Mr. McGrath, you too have five minutes to address council. Uh, good evening, council. Uh, we'll keep it brief. The city has a responsibility to protect its citizens. The city claims that citizen safety and security is paramount. Um, it's questionable or, or I'm, I would ask that city council step up and show the city, show the citizens that that is in fact the case. Um, this property at 264 Nickel Street is nothing more than an open, hair, an open air crack house. I haven't seen any indication of lives being saved. We've, we hear the talk, you know, that they're, they're saving lives, they're doing this, they're doing that. There's no, no proof. It's an open air, open air crack house, that's all it is. Um, we see the chop shop, we see the, the wheelchair getting stolen, we see, um, I don't know whether the report contains uh, a list of the number of ambulance calls and fire calls to the, to the site in the last eight months, nine months. Um, we have seen since the last time we, we appeared at council here, we have seen things get even worse. And Mr. Middleton referred to it with the cooking oil and everything else. Uh, that's environmental issues, safety issues. Um, you gotta do something, plain and simple. That's it. Council, any questions or points of clarity for Mr. McGrath? I Thank you very much. Any. Which brings us to our third delegation on this item, uh, Ms. Ann Livingston from Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users. Hi, 
Um, Anne couldn't make it today, and was wondering if I could take her place. I work at Nandu. We'll allow it. Uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Councilman, and staff. Uh, we do need your name and address. Oh, my name is Sarah Edmondson. Um, I'm a resident of Nanaimo and a member of the Nanaimo Area Network of Drug Users, otherwise known as Nandu. I started volunteering, sorry, I'm a little emotional. I started volunteering at Nandu near the beginning of summer and quickly started doing some admin work, as well as taking a position as volunteer coordinator. What has happened, though, is more than just an admin job. I have become a counselor, big sister, a shoulder to cry on, advocate, and much more. So many of our members need support but cannot access it. Thank you. Um, many do not have a safe place to socialize and spend time with friends and family. This is when they come to Nandu. In my short time there, I have been witness to many of these members at their lowest, rise up out of their deepest depression, and go on to rejoin society as a productive citizen. They have had help from Nandu to navigate through the processes of finding placement and treatment, become sober, and continue on to live stable lives, living in stable living quarters, as well as land gainful employment. Without this safe location and advocacy for these members and support from Nandu's caring staff, this may not have been possible. I can only imagine how many we could help if we were funded better, had no more fear of being shut down at any moment, and supported by the community instead of frowned upon. The number of overdoses we have not only dealt with, but also prevented is huge. Most fatal overdoses happen when people are alone, either at home or on the streets. Nandu staff are trained to both prevent and deal with overdoses, as well as supervising our members in the safe using areas. We also do various training courses for our staff and volunteers. Some of these training sessions include naloxone administration, first aid, CPR, and nonviolent crisis resolution, to name a few. Nandu has had zero fatalities since its creation. Zero. We also have less overdoses in one month than they do downtown in a typical week. A few months ago, after we had to close, a young man went across the road to McDonald's and suffered a fatal overdose within one hour. If I had my way, we would be open 24-7. Imagine how many lives we could save then. Earlier this month, I witnessed an incident in the alley next to DQ. There was an oil spill. Within 60 seconds, myself and a few other volunteers sprang into action and stopped the oil from reaching the main road. I then worked on cleaning up the spill for three days, again with help from a few members. The RCMP will still not let us know who this person was so that we can ban them from the Nandu property. As some of you may know, we do run a volunteer program at Nandu. Volunteers work one of two positions, a floater who floats around the lot and neighboring neighborhood picking up garbage, making sure no one is hanging out or camping in the alleys and parking lots around the area. We do clean up of an MGM parking lot as well as the DQ parking lot. The table person stays in the tent, hands out safe supplies, disposes of used noodle, needles, and supervises the members making, their vital, making sure their vitals are good by measuring blood oxygen level and pulse, as well as waking them up to make sure they are not overdosing. Since we started the program, I have seen numerous members go from not wanting to do anything for anyone to taking it upon themselves to clean up garbage, clean the lot, or even clean the kitchen and do dishes without any compensation or even being scheduled to do so. Now I'd like to read you a few quotes from Nandu members. M says, Nandu has saved me from dying outside and alone. I am alive because of the staff at Nandu. K says, Nandu has taught me how to be more presentable in public and, so and socialize even with my crippling social anxiety. I got a job, too. C says, I learned how to open up and talk about my problems, talk about my emotions and feelings. I also learned how to cry. R says, I'm alive. The first day I went to Nandu was a bad day. My friend took me. I was going to kill myself that night. And S says, I have learned how to save lives at Nandu. I think that's the biggest present anyone has ever given me. Um, there have been a few incidents where the police have been called um, and people have mentioned that these people have come from Nandu. Um, we still don't get any proof of that. We don't get the names of these people so that we can ban them from the Nandu lot. Um, it's also like anything bad happens within five blocks of Nandu, we are blamed for it. When a lot of the time we are the ones that are stopping people from hanging out in the alleys and doing drugs in the alleys and doing drugs even in sight of any of the neighboring buildings. We have a no site policy. Anything has to be done in the tent so that none of the neighbors can see um, in respect to the neighbors. Um, um, there's so much I want to say. Um, I actually got into a 
a conversation with one of the presenters or delegations that just presented on Facebook and had quite a lengthy conversation um, and felt like we were just being blamed for everything that happened. Um, they, does the Salvation Army get blamed for everything that happens within blocks of them or even yes. the... Yes. So that is five minutes so we can wrap it up. We do have some questions. Okay, though. questions are good. <laughs> Uh, Council, oh, Councilor Perino. I'm not sure I, can, I even know where to start, uh, Mr. Chair, but I, I want you to know I think you've done a great job tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Can I just have your name again because I missed it? Sarah Edmondson. Edmondson? Miss Edmondson. Edmondson. So, you know, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being a volunteer you... there. Thank goodness you were there. The hard part for us is that when when taxpayers are asked to pay a big tax bill, they have expectations and very fair expectations. Yes. So, you know, when we're listening to them, it's really easy to see their side because they're paying for a service that they certainly don't feel they're getting. Mm -hmm. The part that I struggle with, you know, because I've spent most of my life in healthcare is that the people who come to Nan Nandu don't necessarily get the extension of the health care that they need to truly improve and go on with their life. Mm -hmm. Thank God we can save as many as you do. But the concern is, so, so what happens? What's the follow-up? If there was Nandu, then serious uh, medical care to take a patient forward, and get them well and get them back and reintegrated into society the way they want to be, I'd be a thousand percent behind it. That's, we do a lot of that. Councillor Perino, I, I, just, I just want to say this is for questions or points Thank of clarity you, so, for so, the delegation. So, you know what, and I apologize, I was just, I, you know. So my question to you is, do you get much help from Island Health as far as follow-up? No, <laughs> not really, no. It yeah. would be great if we did, but we, we advocate as much as we can. Um, I'm a mental health worker as well as a residential home care aide. Yes. Um, so I help them kind of navigate to the point where we can help them and then <laughs> CMHA or, or VHA has to take over and that's where we kind of lose them. But we do, we do really want everybody to get into recovery. We do, we're not just there to help them use drugs. Okay. A lot of them have actually gone through recovery and gotten jobs and stuff because of us. Okay, thank you, thank you. Councillor Eastmere. Sorry, it doesn't automatically turn on when I hit next speaker. Yes, yeah, so through the chair, um, thank you so much for coming to speak to us and um, for all the effort that you've put in. Uh, can you give us, us a sense of how many volunteers you're currently coordinating? Well, we have three shifts a day, two positions, three shifts a day, seven days a week. Um, and basically everybody in Andu wants to volunteer now. Um, we're very strict about the volunteers though. There's no sleeping on your shift. There is no um, deviating from your tasks. Like I, I'm pretty strict about my volunteers, I guess you could say. They call me the nag of Nandu. Uh, so um, there's a lot, <laughs> there's quite a few, so many that I, I literally can't get them all on the schedule. They, they get like maybe two shifts every three weeks because there's so many of them. So like. 20 people, 30 people approximately? At least. At least, okay. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you maintain like a list of your current volunteers? Yep. And do they sign in for, for shifts or anything like that? Yep. Okay. yep, they sign in for shifts. They get, um, they sign for their stipends at the end of their shift. Um, they sign um, materials that they need for their shift in and out, like walkie talkies and busy vests and stuff like that. Um, and Last time we had a delegation uh, come to talk to us about Nandu, we were told that about uh, approximately 200 people were using the site per day. Would you say that that's an accurate representation? We get approximately a, close to 200 signatures a day. Um, that may not be 200 different people, that may be people leaving. We require people to sign in if they've left for over half an hour and come back. Um, I also just wanted to make one, no, never mind, sorry. Question time. <laughs> I really appreciate hearing that because um, initially we were told that the record keeping was sparse and people weren't really signing in and out. So you would say in the in the last 
is that a change since the last time uh, Ms. Livingston came to council? Um, I've always maintained um, sign in or you're not in kind of thing. Um, we can't ma make it mandatory because it is supposed to be anonymous kind of. So um, they, they sign in with Ken or Barbie or something like that sometimes, but um, the signatures are very accurate with the amount of people that come in. And I keep a spreadsheet with the amount of um, members that we have come in, in on average day and stuff. So I have the last four months of numbers, I guess. Okay, thank you. And. Um, just one more question, if I may. Um, in just the first couple of weeks of this year, have you had any ambulance calls to the Nandu site? I think we had, I think we've had two. Neither of them were for an overdose. Okay. One person had a heart attack where they thought she had a heart attack. Um, and what was the other one for? I think the other one for was for um, a head injury. And, and just in those cases, was the ambulance able to enter the, the compound or were they? Oh, yeah, yeah, we have emergency parking set aside. Um, none of the paramedics that I've seen come into Nando had any problem or felt unsafe entering into the, the tent. Um, as soon as paramedics are on scene, everybody knows you put everything down. There's no smoking, no getting out of your chair, no nothing, no crowding, anything. Even when we have an overdose, everybody knows to stay seated, not move. The two people that are designated to deal with them on that shift are the only two that are allowed to. It's not chaotic at all when we have an overdose or anything like that. Everybody knows exactly what to do. Is that a new policy? Nope. It's been like that for a while, for me anyways, with my volunteers and stuff. Um, yeah, it's been like that Thank for you. as no far as I can questions. remember. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair, <clears throat> and thank you to the presenter. Um, since Nandu was last here, a new OPS service has opened um, very close to the Nandu site. Can you talk to me about what that has done for your operations, if anything? Um, nothing really so far. Um, I know they're not going to be fully operational until the end of 2023. Right now they have no heat, no bathroom. Um, they're not watched as well as they think they are at Nandu. Um, I've had some people actually tell me that they were scared to leave their friends behind because they weren't being watched properly. Um, and uh, our members find it very stark and unwelcoming, kind of. But um, they do, they're doing the best they can. They had to open up in a hurry, I believe. Um, so they're slowly getting all their permits and everything together. But um, it hasn't really done anything to us except for cause a lot of conversation in the tent. You haven't noticed any of your members going, like this isn't a service that your members are using? Pardon? Sorry, the new OPS, this isn't a service that, that Nandu members are using. Is that accurate? I know quite a few people who have gone up there and taken a look at it and gone in. Um, most of them say they're not going back. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Manley. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, thank you, Ms. Edmonton, for your presentation and, and for coming here. It's, uh, your, um, you know, hearing that the neighbors aren't happy with what's happening in, in the Nandu site. And we do get photos sent to us of activities around the site, mm -hmm. the oil spill, people using in the alley. Um, we get fairly regular reports and complaints as do bylaw and the police. Can you tell tell me, um, since the last time that uh, Ms. Livingston was here, what actions have been taken to mitigate uh, the impact on the neighborhood? Um, we've become more strict with our floating duties. People are doing the, it's like a two block radius now where we pick up garbage, make sure nobody's doing anything outside the view of the tent. Um, the oil spill was pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> We don't. We still don't know who that person was. The RCMP said they know who it was, but we're not being told who it was, so that we can ban them from Nandu. Um, anything that is against rules or regulations or detrimental to the community that anybody does gets them banned from the Nandu property. Um, uh, we have quite a few people banned now, actually. Um, there's how many people? Of, how many people are banned? I'd say uh, just under twenty, probably. Okay. Again, it's hard to keep track of every single person that's banned. We have their name up on a board, when they were banned, how long they're banned for, and they're supposed to come in and talk to us at our Saturday meetings um, to be able to plead their case and be let in. But Have you reached out to the South End Community Association? Pardon? Have you reached out to the South End Community Association? Um, I myself have not. I know Anne has. Um, 
I'm just starting to get more involved in Nandu with, with getting reaching out to the community and stuff like that. Um, that was on my list of things to do. I want to kind of do an open house type thing and invite all our members of the community and everything to come and ask us questions. And, and I'm more than willing to answer any questions anybody has for me or Nandu by calling Nandu or emailing me or anything like that. I love talking to people. And have you reached out to, to the neighbors? Uh, has, has anybody gone to, to speak with the neighbors about, about the site? I myself have tried to speak to quite a few neighbors and none of them want to speak to me at all as soon as I say I'm from Nandu. Um, do you consider yourself a peer? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for, for, for being here. I mean, it's a, that's a lot. It's a brave thing to do. Is there, are there people living on this site? Pardon? Are there people living on this site? I understand there's an RV there. There is security that stays on the site overnight. And a lot of the time when people see people there after 10 o'clock, it's because a staff member has stayed behind to take care of somebody who was not fit to be kicked out at 10 o'clock at night. They're like, like, we stop people from doing things after nine o'clock. We say last call and everything like that so that everybody's pretty much ready to go and out the gate by 10 o'clock. There's some stragglers sometimes, but if we feel like if we find that somebody's not fit to be able to get kicked out of the compound, we let them stay for a little while and sober them up and make sure they're okay to leave. Okay. And do you, do you have, you still have medical support coming to the site? Do you have uh, yeah, you we know, have VHA teams or? We have nurses every Thursday that come and do STI testing, AIDS testing, HIV testing. And then we have wound care that also comes a couple times a week and people can go into their brand new ambulance type thing and get all their wounds taken care of and cleaned and everything like that. Plus we have quite a few people on site that do have first aid. So. And the wound care is related to? Um, if anybody has any wounds, cellulitis, anything like that, um, cuts, gashes, anything that they need taken care of, clean or anything like that that's getting bad, they'll, they'll go and talk to wound care people. Plus we also drive quite a few people to the hospital. When, they um, don't go. <laughs> when Ann Livingston was here, she characterized the site as the inmates running the asylum. Is that how you would characterize the, the operation of Nandu? Yeah. Do you think that that was a fair characterization? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we do have a couple other councillors wishing to ask questions. I have Councillor Gesselbrock and then Councillor Armstrong. Councillor Gesselbrock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Ms. Edmondson, for uh, coming to speak today. Uh, you know, the, the, the peers and the volunteers at Nandu have been carrying a heavy weight and appreciate that. And uh, I just was curious. Um, What's been the hardest thing to, to manage? You know, there's been, there is a lot of complaints and a lot of issues sort of surrounding around the site. And, you know, I do understand that people's lives have been saved, but I'm just curious what's been the hardest uh, to manage uh, just with the, the resources you have? Um, the sheer number of people that come there, we basically do as much as we can with nothing. Like um, a lot of the time we're paying for propane to heat the tents out of our own pockets. Um, we have people collecting cans and donating them, like members donating us cans so we can pay for, for toilet paper and stuff like that sometimes. So it's basically just basic needs for everybody that's there, heat and running water and a working toilet and stuff like that. Thank you. Councilor Armstrong. Thank you. I guess mine's not working on your thing. So um, a couple questions. Um, you talked about ambulance. I've heard from paramedics, firemen, and police that they've been blocked access from Nandu on more than one, one occasion. Can you comment on that? Sorry, they've been what? I've heard from the police, paramedics, and fire that they've been blocked access into Nando on more than one occasion. Uh, can you comment on that? And there was a video shown to us of people not allowing ambulance access into the site. I have not heard about that. I would... Freak so that wouldn't happen under your under your watch? We are under strict instructions to pull the ambulance into the, the compound if they need to come into the compound. The police usually stop at the door and ask to talk to someone. It's usually me. I go out, I ask them what they would like, if they want to look around the tent or anything like that. They're usually looking for a missing person. Um, we've never blocked, I, as far as I know, we've never blocked access. Thank you. And can you comment on, we've seen videos of people being also being dragged out of Nandu and left on the streets and then, then other people calling the ambulance and videos have been sent on that. Can you comment to that? That should not be happening. 
I, like plain and simple, that should not be happening. It has not happened when I was there. So you can see our concerns, right? Yeah. Different people, Definitely. there's different rules, there's different things, and, and that's one of my biggest concerns is that there's no proper oversight and the, and the public that live around there are paying the price for that. No, I definitely, there's no way that should be happening at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see no additional speakers from council, so I uh, just want to thank you, Ms. Edmondson. I know it's not easy to come in and uh, 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 represent voices that aren't typically in these chambers, so thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay, Council, I suspect there may be some debate. Of course, Mr. Laverge and Mr. Lindsay are here to answer any questions. My preference would be to have a motion on the floor before we get into the debate. Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I move the staff recommendation. Is there a second? Seconded by Councillor Hemmings. Any discussion or questions through to staff? Just, just a follow-up to Mr. Laberge. Have you received any reports, such as I've heard from uh, police and fire, about their concerns of having access to Nandu? Through the chair, yes, I've heard similar complaints described by Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. I have Councillor Manley and then Councillor Hammonds. So through you, uh, Chair, to um, Mr. LaBerge. Um, are there a list of things that this uh, organization can do to uh, mitigate uh, the problems at this site? Through the chair to Councillor Manley, we haven't itemized it, but uh, just hearing the information provided by the community, I think there are a, a couple of things that readily stand out. Uh, one is governance and capacity. When we have um, designated overdose prevention sites, they're usually scaled to, to, to manage a, a small user group. And if I use the example of the current designated site at 250 Albert Street, uh, the outdoor consumption area has a maximum of eight uh, clients at, at any time. Um, referencing back to uh, Ms. Livingston on the November 21st meeting, uh, she reports that they have up to 200 users at any time, and, and I would respectfully su suggest that far exceeds the capacity of that site and the threshold of the neighborhood because, of course, anybody that uses can leave at any time, and that's just far too many people in an, an unstructured environment. So I think uh, capacity issues, and, and then with that comes the, the, the governance. Um, it is a volunteer site, and it is, it's suggested in the staff report. Um, ostensibly, a report from the neighborhood and, and what the staff has seen is that the governance actually seems to have uh, declined since around the Christmas season, meaning we used to see uh, the outside perimeter secured and there would be one uh, pedestrian gate for access and that would be where there's a, a, a sign in and, and take an inventory of who's coming onto the site and we have we stop by just about every day and we don't see that level of oversight anymore uh, the vehicle gate is wide open people are coming and going and, and, and with, with animals and, and driving vehicles in and there's there's nobody meeting them or, or taking account of what's going on in the, in the overall site nor do we necessarily see the, the you know the type of patrols that were described and uh, not to say that we're there all the time and maybe they're not happening but uh, when you have uh, volunteers providing their services as opposed to a designated site that has full-time um, staff it, it really contributes to the types of um, impacts that the, the neighborhood has described um, could I could I just ask you um, uh, through through the chair when a, when a property is designated as a nuisance property, the, the property owners, the leasees, the, the people running a, whatever business it is have an opportunity to, to mitigate the impact on the neighborhood to make things right. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an order to shut down. Uh, I, I, I don't think this is a business license. We're, not, we're talking about a club here, not a, uh, not a business. But it's not an order to shut down. It's really an order to to request that they comply with bylaw to to um, allow the neighbors to have the peaceful use of their of their property. Yeah, through the chair, that uh, th that's a fair assessment. But I would add that it's a have clear efforts have to be made to mitigate 
activities that are of nuisance nature, uh, both the things, the disturbances uh, and the behaviors that occur on the site, but also as they flow back into the community. So at both on, on and off site, there, there's a certain responsibility in, in this type of operation. Have you had a chance to visit the other site that's run by um, CMHA and have there been any complaints about it? Uh, through the chair, I've met with the executive director and toured the outside of the site, but not toured inside while it's in operation. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, I'm not aware of any complaints directly referring to the conduct of patrons on the site, but we have received uh, complaints uh, about uh, congregations of people that are, are um, sheltering in the site. And, and I would say that um, the operators have, have stepped up and really improved that since it was opened as a designated site. Thank you. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Chair. Um, through you to uh, Mr. Lindsay, I believe. One of the um, reasons I think we were really excited about the new OPS opening is that we were hoping it would divert some of this traffic to a resource, being Island Health, who could provide more wraparound supports or more holistic supports. Um, I know it's very early days, but we do we have any indication from the health authority or from CMHA about the population they're serving and whether it's a movement from the Wesley Street population or whether they're actually drawing from the Nandu population? Um, thank you, through, through the chair. So the, the most recent update I think I have is from last week where uh, the director of CMHA indicated to us that approximately 50 people a day are using the site. So the site on Wesley now is completely closed. Mm -hmm. The operation at 250 Albert is now the sole uh, designated OPS in town. Uh, for comparison, it was it was um, stated to me that that's comparable to the numbers that they were seeing at Wesley Street uh, prior to the Wesley Street encampment when it, I guess it was operating at its peak. Thank you. Okay, we have Councillor Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, there is a motion on the floor, a recommendation on the floor, which uh, I am uh, most definitely going to support. I, I think there are two sort of, well, definitely related issues here, and we seem to be getting, we're getting, we're getting caught up in, in the second issue, which is, is a, relates to how well this Nandu site is managed or operated or how effective it is or whether it's needed or not or whether it's uh, approved or managed by Island Health, which I understand it's not. But to me, putting that aside, what we're really dealing with is what is the criteria for designation of a nuisance property? It doesn't matter what business or activity is happening on the property. If there is a substantial identified negative impact to the neighborhood, to the community, to the residents, to the nearby businesses, then it can and should be identified as a nuisance property, no matter what is happening on that property. So when I read that there have been 14 RCMP complaints uh, since I believe April of last year to this property, that there are reports of drug dealing, drug use, noise complaints, vehicle engines revving, assaults, intimidation, harassment, property damage. You know, to me it's secondary what caused those. The fact that they have happened and been reported and been the subject of complaints is serious enough to make the uh, bylaw department of the city and the RCMP uh, think that this deserves to be recognized as a nuisance type property. And as Councillor Manley has pointed out, it doesn't mean that the city has the right to shut it down, unfortunately or not, as your view would dictate, but it simply means that we are serving notice to the landlord that the disturbances caused by activities on this property are unfair to the citizens and the taxpaying residents of our city. And to me, we have a civic responsibility to fulfill our bylaw uh, requirements to follow through on that. Thank you. Councillor Manley. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to say I agree 100% with Councillor Thorpe. Um, I support this, the concept of, of a peer-supported site. I, this council has stated that we support the ministerial order, that we have asked the provincial government, we've asked VHA to step up and help in this situation, and 
we're in a position uh, where we have to stand by bylaw. And um, I recognize the rights of drug users and peers to organize, self-organize. You have constitutional rights, you have rights, but with rights come responsibilities. And those rights cannot impinge on the rights of other people. And that's where things have crossed the line here. And so, you know, we don't want to see any more deaths from overdose in this community. And the homeless situation in this community is untenable. You know, Nanaimo used to be an affordable place to live. And so there's a lot of working class people here that are struggling with the cost of housing and with, with, with homelessness. And some of that population are street entrenched and, and addicted and dealing with mental health issues and they need help. And we need, to, we need to see the humanity in this situation. You know, we can't um, uh, dehumanize people in this situation. And, and I see some of that in social media and it's abhorrent. So what, what we need is we need help from senior levels of government. We've got serious issues in this community, but we have a responsibility as a council to the citizens of this community and the neighbors of this site need the peaceful enjoyment of their property. And so the, the, you know, saying that this is a nuisance property does not mean it means, does not mean that it's gonna be shut down. It means that you have an opportunity to operate this properly, to get organized properly, to mitigate the impact on the neighborhood, to do some outreach, to make sure that if you're gonna continue on, this may not be the best place for Nandu, but if you're gonna continue on, you have to respect the neighborhood and you have to work with your neighbors and you have to work with the community. And I know there's supporters of this uh, site in the health community and, and in the, the social services community and those organizations and those people need to step up to help. That's the bottom line here, thank you. Councillor Armstrong, and then Eastmere and Perino. I was just going to state what Mr. Manley or Councillor Manley said. I agree 100% that uh, if if VHA and I know that their representatives do believe in this site, then they need to step up and properly fund it and give you the tools to do the job properly. But we are left with dealing with with with, and the neighbors are left with all the issues that come with it, and that's not fair and it's not right. When little kids are scared to even go downtown and be around people because of what they've witnessed there, that's concerning. We've heard that from people, and I'm, I know Councillor Hammond spoke directly with the family member of that. That's very scary when a, when a child is scared to leave their own home and wants to only be inside because they don't feel safe in their neighborhood. And for me, and again, it's, it was, and it's been stated, you know, this is not shutting you down. It's giving you the opportunity to bring things into line with community expectations. And also, if, if the people in, in government that so strongly believe in this, as Councillor Manley said, then they need to step up and give you the funds to do your job properly. So I will be voting in favor. Thank you. Councillor Eastmere. Uh, thank you. Um, similar to, to what's been shared by Councillor Manley and Councillor Armstrong, um, I think that I wholeheartedly support harm reduction, and I strongly believe that peer-run and, and peer-led services like this can be really, really successful and um, are really an important part of this puzzle. Um, and our vote tonight is not a referendum on, on harm reduction or um, the fact that these services are really important. Uh, it's simply the fact that neighbors are really, really suffering because of what's happening on this site, and we have a duty as council to help protect the, the community. And my sincere hope would be that uh, this is an opportunity to bring the site into compliance and um, I totally understand that that volunteers on the site are doing their absolute best with not enough resources and not enough support from the people that sh should be supporting you so honestly I don't think it's um, it's the fault of, of the volunteers at Nandu right now I really think you're you're doing your very very best and I'm sorry that there hasn't been more uh, support for you and I really hope that we can work together to, to make this successful, um, but unfortunately tonight I, I will be supporting this um, nuisance declaration. I just really hope that we can get the site back into a, a safe 
um, situation so that neighbors are, are happy and that it's actually providing the support that, that people in our community desperately need. Thank you. Councillor Prino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And you, you, what the most irritating part of this entire story for me is that drug addiction, alcoholism is a disease. And the situation at Nandu is completely unacceptable because not because you're not doing the job that you were there to start to do, it's the fact that you don't have the resources that you need to do the job. And that's why I asked the question, where was Island Health in supporting this? So if there's one thing that this w vote tonight will do, I'm hoping is show Island Health that they need to step up to help you to do the job that you're doing. Because our neighbors that live around Nandu deserve to have a respectful place to live and enjoy and raise their children. And this is not happening. So if there's one thing that we may see some success from, it's the vote tonight. Because this is a disease and it needs to be dealt with just like we deal with cancer or any other disease. It's important that we do it respectfully. And I just, I'm just, um, everyone tonight, the, all the speakers were excellent. I just really appreciate you being here and, and speaking up on behalf of the residents as well as the people that use Nandu. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of the speakers list. And oh, sorry. Oh, okay. We'll go Councillor Gesselbrock and then Councillor Hammonds. <clears throat> Thanks, Chair. Um, I was very concerned uh, with having a, a, an open and functioning uh, overdose prevention site. Uh, it, we're, we're in a drug overdose crisis and there's, you know, over 60 people a year are, are uh, dying from from a drug overdose. And um, there was a hole in the, you know, the, the peer group Nandu stepped up and, and were providing the service uh, in a vacuum of resources and um, providing, you know, over overdose prevention site in a safe manner for for the surrounding community requires, uh, you know, certain considerations around the location and, and also the resources necessary to keep the unfortunate parts uh, that that happen, you know, with drug abuse um, and criminal elements and, and the disorder that can go around with that uh, out of, you know, harm's way of the surrounding neighborhood and community. And, and unfortunately, um, because of the lack of resources, that's not that's not happening at this particular site. And um, in that vacuum of resources, uh, you know, we as a council do have a duty uh, to, to, to you know, maintain a certain level of expected, uh, you know, public safety. And um, I think that, you know, we do have this new site open. I think that there is a, a huge uh, need for, uh, for peer support. Um, within uh, addictions and um, I think that that's something that uh, the province uh, needs to, to to work more closely with uh, peer support services and integrate it within you know the, the services that are provided and and also um, dramatically increase the, the the resourcing and so uh, my heart goes out to all the folks and, and it's the lack of uh, of resources that are currently out there and um, you know if there's a message uh, you know for island health and the province is that um, you know, there is uh, progress, but uh, we need a, a huge amount more effort uh, in this area. So thank you. Councillor Hemmons. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm also going to support uh, staff's recommendation tonight, and I, I appreciate the words of all of my colleagues at this table and those who have presented over the course of um, council debating and uh, contemplating this issue. Um, I could talk for hours about this complex issue and the multiple pieces and the influences, et cetera, et cetera, but um, I'm going to be brief and say um, I want to thank the neighborhood for continuing to advocate responsibly and um, compassionately and informatively to council over the course of a really difficult eight months. Um, Unlike my colleague, uh, Councillor Thorpe, I cannot divorce this designation um, from the service that is provided on site. And I think along those lines, the city has structurally acknowledged that by taking a light approach to this, because we acknowledge that, yes, this is difficult for the community, but wow, this is, this is a service that exists for people who don't have any other services. And that's, that's complex. Um, 
I want to rebut a little bit about the comments around Island Health and say that I think that Island Health has worked um, well in this situation within their resource limitations and they have um, quickly moved to have the 250 Albert OPS open as a result, I think um, partially as a result of the pressures that the, the neighborhood was experiencing over Nandu. They reorganized the primary care outreach team to go into the site. Um, I think they've done what they could in these terrible circumstances. I think where I find the greatest challenge is that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a funded service in the community that is funded provincially, but without any um, checks and balances from the provincial government to say that this is okay in community. And now this council is exercising its bylaws, potentially tonight, to respond um, to a service that the province has placed in this community without any checks and balances. And I think that is a difficult position to place this council in, and I don't, I don't blame anyone. This is just an awful situation all around. But that is a particularly thorny piece for me. I'll leave it there and just say that I'm, I'm happy we're, um, we're here tonight, and I'm happy to support. Thanks, Councillor Hemmons. That brings the end of the speaker's list. Just before I call the vote, I will say I won't be supporting this motion. Uh, what's on the table is a cost recovery mechanism. It's not an injunction. It's not a, uh, to close the site down. Um, I, I feel slightly frustrated on this topic because, as Councillor Hemmons indicated, it's funding from the ministry with, with not enough funding to do it right and to do neighborhood impacts. I agree with her that Island Health has made some attempts, but at the same time was there in those meetings where, for all intents and purposes, promises of additional resources to mitigate neighborhood impacts were more or less committed to um, and never delivered. Um, and so when I look in the chambers and I see who presents, I see members of the community, I see members of NANDU, and I see none of those organizations taking responsibility uh, for a service that is desperately needed in a model that is going to help people. Um, and th there's going to be a whole specter of models. So uh, I'm voting against this uh, simply just because it's a cost recovery mechanism and I, I, I think it's largely much ado about nothing. Um, uh, and I say that not, uh, not as a commentary on the neighborhood impacts or the genuine need for, for uh, the type of services that NANDU is offering in the community. Um, I just think this is a flashpoint uh, because there's no other place uh, that exists because there's no other tables being created in the appropriate ministries or the appropriate health authority to more appropriately have this conversation between the community and the user groups. It's going to call the question. All those in favor? And those opposed? Councillor Brown, note is opposed. Everybody else in favor? Uh, thanks to those that uh, spoke tonight and, and took the time to come. Um, appreciate it. Uh, moving on to 12B, 430 Murray, Murray Street, nu Nuisance Property Abatement. Mr. Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, the next item, as you mentioned, is also a consideration for Council to put 430 Murray Street on your list of nuisance properties, again, under your nuisance abatement and cost recovery bylaw, 2019-7250. And again, as outlined in the report, uh, the report goes into mo more detail uh, through the chair, but, the, in, but it, is, uh, con um, it is concerning a single family dwelling at 430 Murray Street that in our opinion, uh, the use of the, the site, the operation of the site is unreasonably interfering with persons and use and enjoyment of property and has required repeated calls for police services to abate nuisances. So again, council, or sorry, staff are recommending the council uh, designate this property as a nuisance. Uh, Mr. LeBerge again is here with me and we're happy to take any questions. There is a motion in the agenda package, Council. Moved by Councilor Armstrong, second by Director Hebbins. Any discussion or questions for staff? Councilor Hebbins? No. no. Okay, sorry. Uh, Councilor Manley. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, so this is a, I'm just curious about the, the actual property. It's a, it's this property owner rents out rooms within a house so is the property owner himself the uh, the landlord and the main tenant or do do we do we know what the situation is with the uh, people that are renting in this uh, through the chair to councillor manley uh, it's my understanding that um, 
properties in a trust and being cared for by the adult child of the property owner who's renting out individual rooms. I understand there's three or four tenancies that are unrelated in the household and the uh, owners maintain a small area of the property for, for their own personal storage needs. Okay, and the, that's no further questions, that's fine, thanks. Councillor Perino. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through through you to Mr. Laverge. Is is this um, this uh, nuisance property uh, abatement? Is th is that the strongest that we can impose at this time? I, I mean, I look at this: fifty-eight calls to the RCMP um, over the past year. I think to myself, we we need RCMP just to stay right there and you know be on guard. I mean, it's this is crazy. Uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Perino, it's a good question. This uh, matter was actually brought to our attention by the RCMP fairly uh, recently, so it's kind of been on staff's agenda just for a little while. Mm -hmm. We do have a suite of, of different enforcement uh, tools that we can use. We can actually go to court with long form information okay. and seek uh, fairly significant sanctions under the community charter okay. or even injunctive processes, but this would be the logical kind of first step. First step? Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no additional speakers, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. Uh, item C, development permit application number DP1257 for the property at 233 Victoria Road. It says Mr. Lindsay, but I see Mr. Holm coming down. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Council. Uh, just uh, give me one second, please. Just open up my agenda. Um, so this is a development permit application, as uh, um, the Chair mentioned. Uh, it's within the South End neighborhood. It's uh, on property of Victoria Crescent, just south of uh, Milton Street. Uh, what's proposed here is a uh, four-unit uh, multi uh, multi-family uh, development. Uh, one of the units would actually be uh, a live work uh, studio. Uh, the proposed uh, development would be accessed, uh, vehicle access from the lane uh, with, um, and it's in a three-story form. It's quite a narrow uh, lot fronting um, uh, on Victoria with, uh, through to the lane. Quite a, an interesting design uh, to, uh, to take advantage of the, um, uh, the zoning on the lot while providing uh, uh, quite a sensitive infill, I guess, uh, development there. If you could bring up, I'm not sure if you're able to, but if you could bring up um, attachment C, please. Um, it'll show you the site plan um, uh, for the proposed development permit to give you an idea how the, uh, uh, the design of the site's appro approach there. Uh, the zoning for the property is uh, DT12, so it's existing zoning, uh, downtown uh, uh, 12 zone. Um, again, the proposals, uh, four units, uh, one live work within a three-story form. There you can see the property highlighted overhead. Um, the, a number of variances are proposed uh, to, uh, to support the, the development as uh, contemplated there. There you can see the site planning, access from the lane, fronting on Victoria. And if you could please bring up attachment E, you can see uh, building uh, perspectives there. They give you a, a sense of, uh, of the uh, the development uh, uh, in three dimensions there. Um, so uh, I mentioned a number of variances are proposed. Uh, one uh, relates to the combined uh, fence height and retaining wall height uh, for small portions of uh, um, the combined fence and retaining wall on the side yards, uh, including um, uh, two uh, pedestrian gates um, that are uh, higher than uh, permitted uh, by the bylaw uh, when combined. Um, there's also a parking stall dimension variance. Um, the, uh, the parking is accessed from the lane. Typically, angled parking requires a two-way access. In this, in this case, uh, they're only able to provide a, a, a one-way access into the site. It more or less functions as a large uh, driveway access to the site rather than a, a drive aisle. Um, so more of a smaller residential form, really. Uh, from that perspective. Uh, there's also a requested variance to the percentage of small cars from uh, 40 to 50 percent. 40 percent what is small car parking stall dimension is what is allowed in the bylaw. Um, the request is for 50 percent. And as well, um, the properties within the um, cash and lieu uh, buyout area for parking. So um, 
in the bylaw, there's an allowance for up to 10% of the uh, required parking stalls uh, to be purchased rather than provided on site. Um, there's a $10,000 fee uh, for uh, parking stalls that are bought out rather than provided. Um, and those, uh, that money goes towards, um, uh, it can go towards active transportation improvements uh, in the area. And um, in this case, uh, the request is what's actually required are five stalls for the development four are provided so that's actually 20 percent they're asking for a, a buyout of one stall which is 20 percent um, of the required parking the parking bylaw allows 10 percent so they're asking to vary the uh, percent of cash in lieu allowed from 10 percent to 20 percent hopefully that makes sense um, the uh, the uh, application has been reviewed by the de uh, design advisory panel uh, with some recommendations uh, to uh, to make revisions that were um, were addressed by the applicant in the revised uh, design that you're seeing here tonight, and uh, the applicants uh, the applications consistent with uh, relevant development permit applications, and uh, provides uh, uh, you know an interesting form of uh, of infill development on an existing lot uh, near the downtown. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holm. I will go to Ms. Perino, but my preference would just be to get a motion on the floor first before we get into questions. And uh, moved by Director Manley, or Councillor Manley, seconded by Councillor Hemmins. Councillor Perino. Uh, thank you. You were, uh, you were there. I am again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, uh, a question, please. Actually, two questions. The first one is, what's a what's a live work? That description was odd to me because in this in this environment of so many people now working from home, I wondered what the difference was because you've got the live live and then you've got the live work, and yeah. I wondered what that meant. Uh, th I, thank you. That's that's a great question because you're right. Most people's homes are have yeah. live work at some. At point. My kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this would allow um, sort of a dedication of, of more space uh, to uh, to the work portion, and I guess it would be specifically designed for. Typically, you're seeing like um, uh, sort of a less uh, less intensive type of um, uh, work arrangement, but um, possibly a, um, a, a legal office or um, uh, that type of uh, arrangement. So it would be um, the lower floor would be dedicated to work. You'd you'd be able to invite the public in and that okay. sort of thing rather than just uh, working from a, at the kitchen table. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. And and one more question, if I may, and. and it, should this motion pass tonight, what's the next phase? Does it go to public hearing? Uh, no, uh, that's a great question, but uh, thank you uh, through the chair. Uh, this is a development permit with variance, so this would okay. be approval tonight. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. You're chair. welcome. Any other discussion, Council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? No, none opposed. Motion carries, uh, which brings us to item D, rezoning application number RA482 for the properties at 488 and 492 Fifth Street. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, this uh, this is uh, rezoning for property near Fifth and Bruce uh, in the Harewood neighborhood. Uh, what's proposed here um, is uh, rezoning from R1 to uh, residential corridor, which is Core 1. Uh, and if I could please um, get uh, the concept plan on attachment B brought up, um, that would be helpful, please. Uh, this, uh, this property is, um, again, in the Harewood neighborhood. It's quite near um, uh, the uh, Harewood uh, uh, University Village in Harewood and uh, on uh, Fifth Street, which is a, an active mobility route to uh, Vancouver Island University. Um, you, know, you can see the concept rendering there of the building and uh, concept plan there. Again, these are conceptual. The rezoning um, is proposed from R1, uh, which is single dwelling residential to residential corridor core one. Uh, this is consistent with the policy uh, direction from the official community plan, the city plan, uh, which designates the property as residential corridor. Uh, the concept here as shown again, concept is uh, 24 uh, dwelling units within a four story form. And uh, should the rezoning be approved though, uh, any uh, development uh, would be um, as provided for within the core one, the residential corridor zone. Um, this provides a, a good uh, infill housing um, opportunity, uh, which is quite near to existing services. I mentioned U University Village and uh, close uh, on a tr uh, transportation corridor to uh, VIU. 
um, and it's well serviced by transit um, as well. Uh, the applicant um, did undertake uh, some consultation. Uh, a meeting was held in uh, July, a, a neighborhood uh, meeting was held in July of 2022. Um, some feedback provided there. Uh, and as well, the application was referred to the Harewood Neighborhood Association. Um, what's proposed here um, uh, would uh, be recommended uh, rezoning from R1 to Core 1 uh, with the number of conditions attached to that. Um, uh, if, the, if the rezonings proposed are supported at, um, at third reading prior to final approval, a number of conditions are recommended to be secured, including a community amenity contribution with a, um, a rate uh, as per council's community amenity contribution policy of $30 per square meter uh, for any residential portion, $34 per square meter for any commercial portion, as the core one does support some uh, commercial floor area potential there. What's proposed here is strictly residential, but there is the potential for some commercial floor area in the future. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, recommended to be secured would be a commitment to the city's step code rezoning policy which would secure one step above the base step code requirement or a commitment to a low carbon energy system in the building. Uh, road dedication is also required uh, recommended to be secured as well as off-site works and lot consolidation should the uh, zoning bylaw be supported at third reading. Um, just in, as far as next steps um, just to speak to that ahead of time so if, if this bylaw is supported here uh, this would move forward to public hearing, um, at which point uh, there'd be a notification opportunity for, for public input, uh, and, uh, and then uh, consideration of third reading following that. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I have Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Prieto, and Councillor Eastmere. Two. Um, the first one is, I noticed that 488 Fifth is, could be a, a heritage, and it hasn't been registered yet. What happens if that, that property does get put forward to the registry. Um, yeah, thank you uh, through, through the chair. So the pro it's currently not on the registry. Um, it, through the Harewood Neighborhood Plan, it was identified as having um, heritage potential. Uh, there's an, an older um, home on, on the property, um, but it, it doesn't have any protected heritage status currently. But if, if, if it does get the protection if somebody applies to have that done, they, what then happens? Uh, the, uh, there would be, if the house were removed, there'd have to be a heritage alteration permit to, uh, to allow that to happen. Okay. And, then, and then my second question is, um, will there be a traffic study available for us at the uh, public hearing? Because that is one of the largest complaints that we've been getting on emails as well as that was at their uh, open house as well. And that is one of my major concerns as well for that area, which is always already extremely busy. Um, I, I would have to uh, confirm that, but um, it is on 5th Street and uh, Bruce, so it's quite uh, well uh, served from a transportation perspective as well as um, well served by transit and, and active transportation routes as well. I think the concern, though, is that number of vehicles coming out into a roadway that's already blocked all the way back that far in the morning, so there's going to be no opportunity for people to, for egress. That would be my concern. Thank you. I'll wait till, till uh, the hearing, public hearing. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Eastmere. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, um, my question is related to the response not being received from the Harewood Neighborhood Association. Um, how long ago was a response requested? That's under community um, consultation. Yeah, thank you uh, through the chair. Uh, it's, it's not unusual um, at times to, to not receive a response if there are, are no concerns. Um, uh, sometimes, too, with the neighborhood associations, and I'm not saying this is the case, but there can be, um, you know, some are more active than others. Um, sometimes there are changes in, in um, the executive and things like that, but uh, the, re the referral would have been sent um, uh, when the application came in, uh, so it would have been uh, last year, um, uh, quite some time ago. And is there, um, like, a follow-up that you typically do if you haven't got a response by a certain time, or? Typically, no. And um, just regarding the um, public information meeting that was held by the applicant, um, it says that 10 neighbors attended the meeting. Um, can you give me a sense of, like, do we keep track of how many people attend these type of public information sessions? And is that considered like a low number of people to, to attend? 
Uh, sorry, yeah, through the chair, I, I would say um, to, to Councillor Eastmere, this is that would probably be uh, reasonable for this this type of uh, the scale of project in this area. It really depends. Some some developments will attract a lot more um, interest, uh, but that is that's a reasonable turnout, um, reasonable level of interest. I think um, it's difficult to say uh, those aren't organized by um, by the city staff to attend. Um, they're recommended. Um, in this case, I'd say 10 is, is a reasonable level of, uh, of interest. Um, we'll see, I guess we'll uh, have a better understanding um, when the public hearing notice goes out if, if, we, uh, if the uh, developer was able to reach out to uh, many of the people that are interested. Thank you. Okay, Council, um, no one else with questions? We do have three recommendations. Uh, they do need to be taken separately. Councillor Armstrong, moving the, the zoning amendment bylaw 2023, 20, number 4500207 to rezone 488 and 492 Fifth Street from single dwelling residential R1 to residential core one. Seconded by Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, uh, the second reading of the bylaw. Moved by Councillor Thorpe. Second by Councilor Prino. Thank you. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. And the third recommendation. Moved by Councilor Prino. Second by Councilor Thorpe. Thank you. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holm. Uh, item E, Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw to add a bulk water rate and water hauling rate. Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Chair. So, as per our bylaw discussion in late 2022, effective January 1st, uh, 2023, water fees were adopted to increase by 5%. Uh, unfortunately, when the update was made to this bylaw in December, the bulk water rate and the water hauling rate were missed and the 5% increase was not applied to these. So that the bylaw that's in front of you tonight um, will see bulk water rates increase by 51 cents to $10.73 per thousand gallons and the water hauler rate increased by 84 cents to 17.73 per thousand gallons. And staff are asking for first three readings um, to be made on this bylaw amendment. Thank you, Ms. Mercer. Any questions for Ms. Mercer? Seeing none, uh, we do have three recommendations, but they must be taken separately. Oh, and Councillor Armstrong, would you mind reading out the, the bylaw? That's for right. Readings, thank you. Okay, I move that Water Works Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 704.20, a bylaw to add a bulk water rate and water hauling rate, pass first reading. Is there a seconder? Second by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion? See none. Call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? I move that Water Rate, rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 704.20, pass second reading and? Is there a seconder? Moved by sec Councillor Hemmings. Any discussion? See none, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? And I move that Waterworks Rate and Regulation Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 704.20, pass third reading. And second by Councillor Thorpe. Thank you. Any discussion? See none, call the question. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, moving into bylaws. Councillor Armstrong, if you could keep your mic on, that would be great. 2023-2027 Financial Plan Bylaw. That Financial Plan Bylaw number, or Bylaw 2022 number 7359 to confirm and adopt the 2023 to 2027 Financial Plan be adopted. Second by Councillor Hemmins. Any discussion? Councillor Prino. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And question through you. Uh, we will have another opportunity to look at the tax implications later in the spring. Is that correct? Um, through the chair to Councillor Perino, yes, we Thank will be you. back in March or April, okay. um, and we will have the final discussion for the budget. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Perino. Uh, call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? See none opposed. Motion carries. Councillor Armstrong. That bylaw notice enforcement bylaw 2022 number 714. 59.18 to sign fines for violations associated with the storm sewer regulation and free bylaws be adopted. 
Second. Second by Councillor Perino. Any discussion, Council? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. We have no notice of motions. Nobody's trying to sneak some other business in passed in the mayor's absence. So that brings us to question period. There's no questions, Chair. There's no questions. So right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Perino, second by Armstrong. All those in favor? None opposed. <laughs> Meeting closed. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, staff, for a nice light agenda. Good job. Good job. Mr. Chair, yeah, I mean, you need to.